There are a number of reasons why talking about the change to a preferred brand in Factor 8 is important. Firstly, to help understand the patient experience helps us as health professionals um, support people and their families um, through this change. Change can be really hard for people, especially change regarding treatments that help ensure current and also future health and well-being. We do know that there are lots of things that influence people's beliefs and perceptions in all, all sorts of healthcare, but in particular around medications. We know that it's not necessarily just patient beliefs, but also health professional beliefs can have an influence as well. Patient beliefs such um, as beliefs around control, beliefs about the medications themselves, beliefs even about the funding agency, um, and also their beliefs and perceptions about the relationship with the healthcare team can, can come into play, and health professional beliefs around control the medications themselves and also the funding agency, but also beliefs about the patient and how they are doing um, are really important. What we do know is that branding, cost and also beliefs around efficacy um, can be influenced and I think sometimes people will develop these beliefs through their own personal experience or experience of people close to them, maybe with other changes, but also the media. Well, branding's very, very interesting and because there's lots of psychological influences when we're thinking about branding, we know that it's really important. So for example, there's been some research that suggests that branded um, headache medication is more effective in relieving someone's headache than unbranded. So there's lots of processes that actually are at work there. I think what's really important is that often the brand of a drug can be perceived as having the responsibility for keeping someone alive or keeping someone well, rather than the actual active component. And I think that often this is reinforced a lot by others. So for example, um, people will say, um, my Panadol is effective in relieving my headache rather than my Paracetamol. Um, and often brands fall into everyday language, so we may not even be aware that we're using a brand name rather than sort of the, the active component of a drug. And I think what's also interesting is that people, whether it's to do with medicines or peanut butter or cars, become very brand loyal. Um, and so when that is disrupted, that can actually be really difficult for people. When I think about the change to a preferred brand for Factor 8, there are a number of things that I would imagine that people could be concerned about, including concerns around the cost, the efficacy, and also adverse effects of the change. So I think that people um, could be concerned about being changed to a cheaper brand, and therefore because it's a cheaper brand, it's less effective. And as discussed before, people will have very long-term relationships with the brand um, that they are on, and then they don't have the same relationship with the preferred brand. So they may ask, will this work for me? They may say, my previous brand, I've, I've been on it for years and it's worked for me, so why do I have to change? People may also have concerns around the development of inhibitors post-change, especially um, if they are tolerating their current brand. I think also people could be concerned about um, the increased number of blood tests and monitoring that may happen over the switchover, but at the same time, uh, the increase of blood tests and monitoring can be reassuring for people. I also think it's really important um, to mention that people may have feelings and opinions about being forced to change 
And I think that this is really important just to keep in mind that people may feel that their autonomy over their health is threatened. Well, I think this sort of leads me to talk a little bit about placebo and nocebo effects. So what, what a placebo or, or nocebo is, is when there's either a benefit or an adverse effect um, attributable to taking a medication um, or undergoing a medical procedure that's not necessarily specific to the physiological um, action of the treatment itself. And I think what comes into this is people's expectations. So either expectations of help or harm. And expectations, like we've talked a little bit before, can come from information provision, personal experience, but also other influences such as the media. And so the either positive or neg negative information can help generate these expectations which in themselves can have um, an effect on, on how something works. I think what's really important to note is that there are many qualities um, that can influence these effects, such as um, medication qualities like cost, maybe colour or packaging, but also expectations of side effects that someone may have the serious of, seriousness of the illness and also clinician characteristics. And what I mean by this is clinician characteristics such as confidence in, in the treatment, concern for the patient and warmth and empathy. So in other words, if a clinician um, has confidence that the change is okay, is able to demonstrate concern for the patient with warmth and empathy, the, um, that minimises any adverse effects that may be there from a placebo or nocebo effect and also the likelihood of, of developing side effects um, due to this. I think another important thing to mention here is, is information provision because what we in, in healthcare will often do in terms of patient support is number one thing is provide them information. However, there is a relationship between information provision and also the experience of side effects. So informing people of potential side effects can actually increase the number of people who experience the side effects. I think another thing that's very important here is that a lot of research has demonstrated that the level of attention directed towards physical symptoms actually can increase the recognition of physical symptoms. So in healthcare we often reinforce how important symptom monitoring is um, and we want people to notice physical symptoms but we also don't want them to focus too much physically because the more you focus physically the more you notice. And so we ask patients, yep, tell us if, if something's going on but actually don't think about it too much and that's a very, very tricky thing to do, especially if someone is worried about a change. Well, I think we can help people and their families with a number of different strategies. And I think number one is actually to think about our communication skills. I'm not saying that health professionals don't have communication skills. However, I think it's really important to be aware of really good effective skills to use, especially when having difficult conversations with people. What we do know is that communication skills are really effective in managing people's distress and anxiety but also if we use effective communication skills patient satisfaction increases. The important skills that I think are really important to consider are the use of open questions which allows a two-way dialogue um, rather than a one-way health professional directed um, conversation. I think also ensuring that you're demonstrating warmth and empathy is very important so 
the patient will feel that you understand what, what they could be going through. I think as well, a really important thing to keep in mind and trying not to say is don't worry. You know, we often use that, um, however, it can be received as being dismissive and that you're not taking um, someone's worry seriously. And I think it's actually okay for someone to be worried when there is a change um, in brand. There may be a group of people who've had a number of negative experiences associated with, with their health, and it's really important to acknowledge this. Um, as a health professional, to acknowledge you've been through a lot over the years is important, but also to acknowledge that therefore, maybe change to a preferred brand may be difficult. I think to help manage this, um, it may be really useful to have an ongoing discussion and negotiation um, and an individual um, planning session about how uh, the switch over can work and what that will do is give someone a greater sense of control over um, when something will happen to them. I think it's really important to talk about ways to help manage anxiety. Most health professionals will have long-term relationships with patients and their families and I think this can be a really good advantage in terms of helping manage anxiety. If you have a good relationship, they trust you and, and that's really valuable. I think being aware that it may not be the patient themselves that may be anxious, it may also be a family member, so being open and aware of this is really important. I think it's really important not to make assumptions about anxiety. And what I mean by this is not to make assumptions that someone is anxious and actually what they may be anxious about. So I'm going to talk about three things that are really helpful in terms of managing anxiety from a health professional. So first of all, acknowledgement. And what I mean by this is to acknowledge that someone may be anxious. I can see that you're worried about this or I can see that you're anxious about this. That's really important. Secondly, exploration. So what actually concerns you about this or what worries you about this? So finding out from them what's going on. Thirdly, explaining. And what I mean by this is finding out how much or what kind of information someone actually wants to know um, and then telling them because we know that information um, can be really, really good in terms of helping manage anxiety. I think it's also um, a really good idea to think about um, talking with people about what their individualised plan um, in making the change to the preferred brand is, but also maybe what the centre's plan is. So they're aware that um, they're being considered individually, but there's a plan for everyone at the centre. I think um, what's also really important is that to help manage someone's anxiety, an ongoing discussion can be really appropriate. And for that, you can actually encourage people to write their questions down. What this does is firstly, when we write things down, often we can stop worrying about them because we know that it's written down. Second of all, when we write things down, um, it ensures that we ask the question and get the answer. I think that for most people, if you follow those ideas, their anxiety will be well managed. However, for some people, they might require some additional strategies. I think a really good additional strategy is distraction. Distraction can be an incredibly powerful anxiety management um, strategy and can come in many different forms. As simply as having a structure or a plan to someone's day so that they're occupied. Second of all, having specific things to do when they're worrying. So for example, reading a book, school or work, playing a game on, on a phone or an old-fashioned puzzle can be um, 
helpful. But also there are many different, really specific distraction exercises that often involve numbers and letters. And actually if you Google um, distraction exercises, you'll be able to see a few examples of this. I think it's also really important to mention that if someone's worries or anxiety um, go on to actually affect their ability um, to function in their daily life, that on, on referral may be really um, appropriate. And so consider your treatment centre social worker or psychologist, um, another DHB service or primary care for anxiety management. There are a number of resources that are available to help health professionals with this change and those are available on the Pharmac website. I think it's also important to know where you can direct patients um, and their families for further support and resources um, in dealing with this change. First of all, um, obviously the local um, treatment centre. Secondly, the Haemophilia Foundation. Thirdly, outreach support workers. And lastly, consider referral to other support agencies um, that your DHB may have available. In summary, there are three important points to take from today. Firstly, change to a preferred brand can be difficult for people. Secondly, ongoing discussion about this can be really helpful. And thirdly, as a health professional, you have the skill, the expertise and the knowledge to help manage this change. Mm -hmm.